everyone. So I'd like to welcome you to today's presentation on brain health and healthy aging. Our presenter for today is Dr. Linda Nwababi. Uh, she is a movement disorders neurologist and diagnoses and treats individuals with Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, tremors, and other neurological diseases. She believes in using a combination of med medication, exercise, and physical therapy and social support to care for the patient, their family, as well as their caregivers. So today's presentation, she'll describe what happens to our brains as we age, and she'll highlight some certain risk factors and diseases that can impact our brain as we get older, as well as important tools to help us protect our brain health. Um, as I mentioned previously, we've allotted some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. So feel free to hold any of your questions until then. Uh, or if you would like to add them in the chat, that would be great as well. And we can address them at the end. Um, additionally, I'll be administering a poll. It's optional and very brief by the end of the presentation just to get some of your feedback on how we can improve. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass the floor to Dr. Nwabavi. Feel free to get started whenever you're ready. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Allegra. Can you all um, hear me okay? Just a th thumbs up. Very good. Very good. Um, thank you guys for having me today. I'm Dr. Nabobi. Okay. Um, I think this is my second or third time going to give a talk um, like this for, for, um, for the CTSC. Um, and um, I'm so happy to be here. And I love giving these talks. And I like being the community. And um, I welcome any questions at the end. So my talk today, um, I will give a very um, simple talk on optimizing your brain health for a healthy, a healthy aging. Um, my specialty is Parkinson's disease and movement disorders. And I believe some of my patients are here in the audience. Um, but in general, you know, we take care of, uh, you know, our patients and their brains. And I think it's important to have these conversations oftentimes. And my goal is to um, teach you what happens to the brain as we all naturally age, and then teach you some of the different factors that pose a threat to our brains. And then what are some things that, you know, each and every one of you can do um, every single day, starting today to promote um, healthy brain aging. Um, okay, so let's get started. I do not have any disclosures, just to uh, put that out there. Um, and then this is the brain. This is a nice schematic yeah. that, that I like. Um, you all know where the brain is located. It's in your head. Um, and it contains three main parts. It's your cerebrum, which is the big part of your, your brain that does a lot of the work. And then there's a smaller part that sits under the brain called the cerebellum. And then there's a, a, an even smaller part called the, uh, the medulla. Um, and it comes down and eventually becomes the spinal cord that runs down your back. And we're gonna get more into what the functions of these, these parts of the brain does. So as we all know, and as I believe, the brain is the most important part of the body. You can argue with somebody else. Um, but the brain has so many different functions um, for our body and it helps us do so many different things. And this schematic right here highlights some of the different functions that different parts of the brain um, helps us with. For example, the frontal lobe, which is sitting in the front of your brain, um, it's really important for problem solving. It also helps regulate your emotions. It helps you with your judgment and making um, decisions. And then also speaking and some voluntary motor activity um, helps with that. The other part of your brain um, that's really important, especially as you get older, um, is called the temporal lobe. It sits on the sides of the brain. And the temporal lobe is where most of our memory is stored. It's also important for your behavior. It's important for our language, being able to speak clearly and being able to understand what people are telling you. You. also important for hearing. The parietal lobe sits on the top middle portion of the brain. And the parietal lobe has some interesting functions. Um, it functions uh, in, in letting us know, differentiate our right from our left side of our body, which is something that you don't even think about, right? It just comes naturally for you, but it's actually a part of the brain that tells you this is your right side and this is your left side. Um, also important for sensation important for reading, and then also orienting your body to, to space. The occipital lobe, which is in green right here, um, it's in the back part of your brain. And this is where um, you, you, um, you control your vision from. And so when you see things, it goes through your eyes and goes all the way to the, this back part of the brain. It also helps us see color. And then the cerebellum, if you remember, is this smaller part of the brain that sits under the brain. Um, and this is the part of the brain responsible for balance and coordination. This is a part of the brain where if you drink alcohol, this is where alcohol goes to. And then you start to feel tipsy and woozy and, and imbalanced. That's where alcohol is going to. That's your cerebellum. Um, 
And then the final part is the smaller part of the brain in this light gray. Um, it's called the, uh, the brainstem and the medulla is what's coming out down here. This is a very, very important part of your brain because it's basically where all the connections from the big part, your cerebrum, all the connections come from the big part of your brain and connect down to this brainstem and it comes down to become your spinal cord. So you can imagine that if anything happens to this brainstem, it's lights out. It carries such important functions such as breathing, also swallowing, it regulates your body temperature, it helps you be alert, it regulates your sleep-wake cycle, um, and it carries all the messages coming from the brain down to your body. So this is a very important part of the brain um, um, and, and it also has its own functions. Now let's go a little bit deeper and look at you know, the cells in the brain, okay? So when you look under the, under the microscope, you're going to find you know, very small cells in the brain and these are called neurons. And these cells basically all come together to communicate and send the messages that your body needs to function. We think that there are over a hundred billion nerve cells uh, in the brain. Okay, and then these nerve cells, they all have, you know, projections that all connect to each other and they all communicate and they communicate through electrical charges that they all release to one another. And they also release these tiny, tiny chemicals called neurotransmitters that they use to communicate with one another. And so communication between these cells, these neurons are very important to maintain the function of the brain. Another important part of the brain that you need to know about is the blood supply to the brain, okay? Your blood carries all the oxygen and nutrients that your brain needs to do all the, um, all the important work that it does, okay? Your brain is actually nourished by one of the richest networks of blood vessels in the body. Every time your heart beats, your blood vessels carry about 20 to 25% of all your blood to your brain. And that's a significant amount. That really tells you that your brain is doing a lot of work. Now, it's really important that, you know, you maintain blood flow to the brain so that it can do the work that it does, okay? Um, it's also important to know that when you're really thinking hard, your neurons, those cells in your brain, they can use up, up to 50% of, of the fuel and oxygen going to your brain. So this is a lot of work that your brain is doing, and it really tells you how um, important it is in your, in your body. Now let's get to what happens to the aging brain. What happens to the brain as we all get older? I like the schematic because it's a nice representation of the natural history of the brain. One of the main things that happens to the brain as we all go, get older is that it shrinks, it gets smaller. And this is something that naturally happens to everyone. You cannot avoid it, okay? We think that this starts around the age of 60 to 70, the brain cells actually starts to shrink. And the parts that shrink the most are usually the parts of the brain responsible for memory, and responsible for planning. And so if you're putting two and two together, you can start imagining like, huh, maybe that's why I'm becoming a little bit more forgetful um, because those are the parts that shrink the most naturally, okay? Other things that happen to our brains as we all get older, remember those nerve connections I told you, those cells that talk to one another, those connections start to decline, okay? And so you can imagine that if there are fewer connections, there's going to be a slower process in speed. Things are, are slower and the connections are not happening as much as they used to. Also, you have a reduction in the production of um, the, those chemicals that I told you about, those neurotransmitters that each of the cells release to one another to communicate. The, it, there's a reduction in their production. So for example, your dopamine in your brain reduces and also serotonin reduces among other chemicals in the brain. In addition, there's a reduction in blood flow. As we all get older, the blood vessels, the pipes carrying up blood to our brain, they start to toughen up and they basically start to rust, as I would call it, and they get you know, harder. And it's hard to get the amount of blood flow that your brain needs. So you have decreased blood flow in the brain as you get older. And then finally, something else that happens is that there is more inflammation. Every time your body goes to some stress, for example, a pneumonia, Every time your body goes through stress, it releases a lot of these inflammatory chemicals that can cause long-term damage in your, in your brain and the rest of your body. So there's, there's more inflammation every time you go through some illness or some other stress to your body, okay? And so these are some of the things that are happening on a more, on a, on a um, small level uh, to the brain as we all get older. Now, how does this manifest physically in your day-to-day -day life? So some changes that we may naturally see as the brain ages are difficulty learning new tasks. So things that would have taken you much faster to learn how to do, it, you find that it's taking you longer to figure things out and learn how to do new things. And then also more trouble multitasking. 
you know, if you're someone before who could, you know, you're cooking a meal, you're on the phone, you're watching TV and you're typing something at the same time. And now you find that it's just harder for you to do all four things at once and you need to focus on one task at a time. Okay, and then difficulty finding words. This is one of the most common complaints that we tend to see. Um, people find that they are searching more for words when they're talking or they lose their train of thought when they're when they're talking, but then it, it comes back to them. And then sometimes difficult to remember names of, uh, of, you know, people that you, you normally see, but usually it would come back to you. But, you know, remember difficulty finding words, remembering names are common complaints that we do see um, as people get older. And then also difficult to remember in appointments, people may find that, you know, they have now have to write things down on the paper, um, whereas before they were able to just remember it quickly. Um, that's another common, common complaint. Difficulty and ability to pay attention. This can get tricky because also as um, individuals get older, hearing can get impaired. So it's often confusing which one is which, and that's why you should go get a hearing test. But um, attention also reduces um, as we all get older. And sometimes people confuse this for memory loss, um, but a lot of times it's not a memory issue, it's an attention issue. Um, you're just not paying attention, hence you're not able to retain the information you just received. And then changing mood is very, very common. If you remember, I told you that as the brain ages, you have fewer and fewer of those chemicals, the neuro, those neurotransmitters. Serotonin, which is responsible for our mood, that reduces as we get older. And so things like feeling depressed and feeling down are more common naturally as we all get older. And it's important to know what the symptoms could be so that you can recognize it and treat it appropriately. And so in general, you know, your aging and health, um, these are affected by, you know, uh, three main things, okay? Aging, well, it, it really depends on your genes, so your DNA, and then it, it depends on the environment that you're surrounded by, and then it depends on your lifestyle, okay? Genes, you cannot do much about, as, at least for now, in 2022, we cannot do much about our genes that we're born with, but your environment and your lifestyle, you can do a lot about, and we'll talk about different things that you can do to make sure that you're maintaining a healthy lifestyle so that you can maintain a healthy um, uh, brain health. First, I wanna talk about what are some potential risks or threats to the brain. And we'll go over each of these one by one. Um, but in general, some medications or improper use of certain medications, um, smoking, as we all know, everybody knows by now that smoking is just bad for you, um, except <laughs> alcohol, um, certain diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, and other health problems, having a poor diet, having insufficient sleep, having lack of physical activity, and then little social activity or being alone. Um, these are all potential risks to the brain and we'll go over each one. The first I wanna talk about is medications and how it affects your brain health. Um, many of you may realize that as you get older, you find that your medication list just increases and increases and you may be, have been taking you know, three medicines at one point and then later you find that you're now on 11 medications. How did you get there? Um, it can happen quite quickly because our body just you know, accrues all these health issues from out of nowhere as we all get older. Now it's important that as you have these medications accrue, it's important to make sure that you understand why you're taking that medication and what it's doing for you. And then make sure that you always speak to your doctor who's prescribing the medication or doctors typically is doctors, um, to make sure that these medications are not interacting. Some medications cross what we call the blood-brain barrier. This is a barrier that protects the brain from the rest of the body. And some medications are able to cross this barrier and they can cause certain side effects like you know, dizziness, feeling drowsy. Some of them can cause confusion. Um, and then when interacting with certain other drugs, it can make these side effects even worse. And so it's important to know what's interacting with what. And you wanna avoid um, potential adverse effects such as you know, falling or being confused and ended up in the hospital. So make sure you talk with your, your primary care doctor and with the doctors prescribing your medications, you know, encourage your doctors to communicate with one another to make sure that these medications are not interacting, okay? And then smoking uh, and brain health. When I say smoking, um, smoking cigarettes, it has been established that this is bad for your lungs, but in general, smoking is just bad for your, your blood vessels, your arteries, it clogs them up, it causes inflammation, it causes a lot of damage, and it affects the blood circulation to your brain. And then smoking also directly um, affects the brain cells themselves, and it kills them up um, through inflammation and other damage. Um, in addition, not just you being the smoker, but being exposed to secondhand smoke can also have similar um, deleterious effects. 
So it's important to know that, um, you know, smoking can directly affect your brain, not just your lungs, you know, with lung cancer that we all know about. Um, and, and it can increase risk of, you know, having stroke, heart attacks, and, and then the lung disease that we know about. And then alcohol um, is one that um, people are often not sure about. Um, you know, some people have been told that, you know, having a glass of wine a day is good for your heart. Um, and there is truth to that, you know, drinking alcohol, you have to do it in moderation. That's the important part. Um, having excessive alcohol, however, it goes to that part of the brain called the cerebellum that I told you about. Um, and, you know, as I told you, you know, when you drink alcohol, it goes to that part and then you feel tipsy and you feel imbalanced. You can imagine that drinking excessive alcohol long-term can now become, you can have more permanent balance problems. And, you know, I've seen a couple of patients who come to me, they're having trouble with balance, you know, they're in their later years and I ask them about alcohol intake and I learned that they've been drinking, you know, alcohol a pretty good amount for several years. And then you look at the cerebellum and you see that it's pretty shrunken and that's because of the alcohol damage to the cerebellum over all these years. And then by the time you have that type of damage, it becomes permanent. You know, your brain cells, they do not grow back. So I often warn my patients about the effects of alcohol. All the effects that it can have besides affecting your balance, it can actually um, um, affect your speech. Um, your speech can become um, a slurred, it can affect your driving, it can affect your memory, um, and then it can cause drowsiness, dizziness. And then long-term, the balance, it can also affect your emotions, your coordination, and also your body temperature. Um, I think drinking alcohol in moderation, that's okay. Um, however, you have to make sure that you don't um, drink um, excessively. And in addition, you have to make sure that you review your medications and which ones can interact with alcohol because alcohol and certain medications when mixed together, um, they can potentiate the side effects of those medicines such as drowsiness, dizziness, confusion, or hallucinations even. And then I want to get into certain conditions that are, uh, that are common that can affect your brain health. Um, and these are among the ones that we'll talk about, including Alzheimer's disease, stroke, Parkinson's disease, heart disease and high blood pressure, diabetes, traumatic brain injury, depression, and sleep problems. So we'll talk first about um, dementia and Alzheimer's. So I just want to make um, definitions clear because this is a common question. People often confuse, you know, what dementia means and what Alzheimer means. So we'll talk about dementia first. So dementia is just a com common term. It's an umbrella term that means that someone is having memory loss and decline in their thinking skills, and it's severe enough to affect their functioning. So dementia is just, it's a general term. It doesn't really tell us the type of disease. Now, there are different types of dementias. Okay, um, Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia and affects over 5.8 million Americans. I think about 60% of all dementias is Alzheimer's dementias. And so people know about Alzheimer's the most because it's just the most common one, but there are other several types of dementia, okay? And so when someone is having symptoms of dementia, it's important to see a doctor. The doctor can determine which type you have based on your clinical history and your exam. And then that may, may got, help guide the treatment strategy. Um, Alzheimer's is most common in people above the age of uh, 65, just as a, you know, just age is one of the major risk factors for it. Um, and then it's important to know that almost 66% of Americans with Alzheimer's are actually women. Um, there are several reasons for this, one being that women tend to live longer than men, and because age is a risk factor for Alzheimer's, we just see higher numbers um, in women. Also important to know that African Americans are two times more likely to have Alzheimer's and other dementias compared to their white counterparts. And so if you're someone of um, African-Americans uh, descent, it's important to know this, knowing that you are just at higher risk. And there are many, many reasons for this um, that we can get into more at a different time, but this is an important fact that people need to know about. And then people who are Hispanic are one and a half times uh, more likely to have Alzheimer's compared to their white counterparts also. Now let's talk about, you know, what are some risk factors for developing um, dementia, uh, 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 different types of dementias, including Alzheimer's. So there are risk factors that you cannot change. For example, just getting older, just being an older individual puts you at risk for developing um, dementia, um, uh, different types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's. And then the other thing is family history. If you have a family history um, of Alzheimer's dementia or other type of dementia, that puts you at a higher risk of developing it compared to someone who does not have a family history. These are two things that you cannot change, unfortunately. However, there are things that you can change, okay? So some things that you can avoid, so head injury, we now know that 
um, if you have a history of head injury, especially if you had head injury multiple times, such as football players, um, this does increase your risk of developing um, a certain types of dementia, such as Alzheimer's. And then having a history of heart disease, this is something that can be controlled. If you heart heart, heart disease, um, you know, as you remember, the heart is what pumps the blood and the oxygen and the nutrients that the brain needs. If your heart is not is malfunctioning and not pumping the appropriate amount of blood that you need, um, you can imagine that your brain is not getting the oxygen and nutrients that it needs. And so over time, you're going to start developing memory issues and other issues you know, with the brain functioning, okay? That's why heart disease is, is important in dementia. Um, high blood pressure. High blood pressure, um, when your brain and your blood vessels are exposed to very high pressures, they cause you know, very, very tiny microscopic damage that over time accumulates. And so high, high blood pressure is one of the things that we call silent killer because it's not something that you, know, you really feel even though it's really high. And over time, if your blood pressure just stays really high um, without being treated, um, it's causing you know, long-term damage that can affect, um, affect your memory and eventually cause dementia. Diabetes is, is another one, the same thing. Diabetes causes microscopic um, inflammatory damage to your brain um, and again can lead to uh, dementias. High cholesterol, same thing. High cholesterol, you know, you, you have um, cholesterol clogging up your arteries, reduction in blood flow, but then it also directly goes and causes damage in the brain. Smoking cigarettes, I already mentioned, alcohol, I already mentioned, and then having an unhealthy diet. You know, you know the saying that, you know, you are what you eat. It is truly the case. You know, you have to make sure that you're eating a healthy, di a healthy diet um, because it really manifests in your brain um, uh, what you're eating. And we'll talk more about healthy diets um, in another slide. I want to talk about what are the warning signs because, you know, I, I, I talked to you in another slide about, you know, what are the things that happen to your brain as you normally age? What are some things that you may see that are part of normal aging? Now, you may wonder, well, how do I know if my symptoms are normal aging or is it, you know, something concerning for dementia? When should I go see a doctor? So listed here are some of the warning signs um, that, you know, if it's happening to you or to a loved one, those are red flags that it's time to go see a doctor. So if you have memory loss that's disrupting your daily life, for example, you're not able to make your doctor appointments anymore or go to the grocery store um, and you're, you're just not able to do the things that you were able to do or, you know, continue to maintain your job and your supervisor at work is complaining or you're making a lot of mistakes, um, you know, at work or you're not able to, you know, um, do your bills anymore like you used to. Those are things that are, that are concerning. If you're having memory loss where you're forgetting people that you should know, for example, you look at your spouse or your child and you don't remember their name, that's quite concerning. So those are red flags to go see a doctor. However, if you have memory loss where, you know, you forget an information that was given to you five minutes ago, and then 15 minutes later, you remember what it is, that is something that can be seen as part of normal aging. So it really depends. So if you're not remembering things and they're just not coming back to you, that is more concerning. Um, if you're having challenges in solving problems, so for example, you know, managing the bills, um, things that you were able to do before, that is a red flag. If you're having difficulty completing a familiar task, um, I had a patient who was an avid, you know, um, she used to cook a lot and um, she had all her recipes in her mind and she knew, you know, what to get next. And then she just started having trouble, you know, cooking something that was so natural for her. Um, that is very concerning. So if you're having difficulty doing something that just was so natural for you, that is concerning for a dementia. Um, decrease or poor judgment. Um, for example, you know, some, some, sometimes dementia can present with excessive spending, spending money on things that you don't need. Um, or, you know, you know, making bets on things, um, just having poor judgment in doing things. If you see that someone is doing this, that could be concerning um, for dementia. And then losing things and not being able to retrace your steps. Um, you know, if you lose something and you figure out, okay, I left the keys here, and then you follow, retrace your steps and you find the keys, that's fine. However, if you're just losing things and not being able to find them, that's another red flag um, sign. Um, if you go to um, um, alzheimers.org, alz.org, they have this worksheet here. It's the 10 warning signs of Alzheimer's. And you know, if you slowly go through each of these and fill it out, um, it can go through all these red flag signs with you. And if you're seeing, finding that you're checking off these, um, um, if you're finding that you're checking off um, all these boxes, these are signs that you should see on a neurologist or a memory specialist to, to discuss these symptoms. Um, 
and this is just exactly what I was saying, um, you know, it's important to see, um, to be validated by a doctor if you're having these symptoms, you know, ask your doctor for a cognitive assessment. Your primary care doctor can do a cognitive assessment, but if they find, if they feel like, you know, you need to see a specialist, then, you know, go see a neurologist or you can see a um, disorders uh, specialist. Um, it's important to know that, you know, Alzheimer's, dementia, and several other dementias, they do worsen over time. And currently, there is no cure. However, there are treatments for some of the sy symptoms of it. Um, and to slow down progression, um, there are certain treatments that are available. Um, and so there are things that can be done for these symptoms. I want to talk about stroke, which is another common um, disease that poses a threat to the brain. So a stroke happens when a blood vessel that carries oxygen to the brain um, uh, or carries nutrients to the brain, if it's either blocked or it bursts and, and ruptures and then you have a bleed, um, that's, that's what a stroke is. And so when that happens, the part of the brain where that blood vessel is supposed to be supplying oxygen and nutrients to is no longer getting it. And so those brain cells in that area um, die off. And so remember the different parts of the brain that I told you, a stroke can present with different symptoms and it depends on where exactly in the brain um, you get that, you get that blood clot that, that blocks it up. And so if you get it in your frontal lobe, it can present with, you know, poor judgment. Um, if you get in your temporal lobe, it can present with, you know, memory issues. Um, if you get in your parietal lobe, it can present with, you know, difficulty sensing um, uh, with, with your sensory, so sensing things. If you get it in the back of the brain, your occipital lobe, it can affect your vision. Um, so stroke can manifest in many different ways. These are some of the most common ways that we see in stroke. And some of you may have seen um, this um, uh, schematic somewhere. This is the FAST. Um, a schematic um, is something that's been put out everywhere so that people know the signs of stroke and know what to do when a stroke happens. But some of the common symptoms of stroke are if you have drooping on one side of your face, if you have paralysis on one side of your body, um, you have sudden speech and language difficulties, uh, sudden confusion, sudden trouble seeing, sudden trouble walking. If you have a sudden severe headache that just shows up out of nowhere, that could be concerning. And then also sudden numbness on one side of your body. One of the keys to these is that it's sudden. Stroke is usually quite sudden. One minute you are well, and then the next minute you are not well, okay? And so if you have one of these symptoms happen suddenly, it's concerning for a stroke. But what's important is that you have to make sure that you call 911 and go to the ER right away because we do have life-saving uh, treatments that can reverse the stroke and reverse the symptoms, okay? I mentioned that call 911. And then let's talk about stroke risk factors and, and prevention. So there are risk factors that you cannot change. For example, increase in age. Um, you cannot help getting older. It's a blessing, I think. But as, as you get older, things just happen and, and stroke risk becomes higher. And then being a man, that's something else that you, know, you can't change. Men are a higher risk of stroke than women. Up until about the age of 80, um, because men tend to die um, earlier than women, after around the age of 80, we start to see higher um, prevalence of stroke in women. And then again, African-Americans and um, people of Hispanic um, uh, uh, origin are higher risk of stroke compared to their white counterparts. And then if you have a family history of stroke, that puts you at a higher risk of stroke compared to people who don't have a family history of stroke. Um, and then if you're someone who's already had one stroke in the past, it puts you at a higher risk of having another stroke um, in the future. And so every time we have a patient who's had a stroke, we basically form a team around that person and make sure that we stay on top of them to reduce their risk of developing a second stroke, okay? And I always recommend that anyone who has had a stroke should make sure they have a stroke neurologist that they follow from time to time to make sure that all their risk factors are being controlled. Now let's talk about risk factors that um, you can change. Okay, so high blood pressure is one thing that you can control. It's one of the big risk factors for stroke. Smoking, as I mentioned before, diabetes is another one that you can control. High cholesterol, having heart disease. So atrial fibrillation, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, is when you have an arrhythmia of your brain, an irregular heart, heart beating of your, um, of your heart. Um, and that can cause blood clots that form and then go up to your brain um, and can cause a stroke. Uh, obesity and not being physically active. These are risk factors for stroke that you can control um, by taking small steps starting today. Excessive alcohol again. Um, certain illegal drugs like cocaine, ecstasy, heroin, and phenomenes, these can all affect um, your blood vessels, which can then lead to uh, having a stroke. And then sleep apnea, which we're also going to talk about um, in a bit. 
a little bit about Parkinson's disease. Um, this is one of the, the diseases that I commonly um, treat. This is my bread and butter. Um, and I see a lot of patients who have Parkinson's disease. Um, Parkinson's disease, it's a brain and nervous system disorder that affects the ability of your, of your brain to control your movements, um, in addition to a couple of other um, functions. Um, the main thing that happens in Parkinson's is that the cells in your brain that make the chemical called dopamine, they're slowly dying off over time. And so what happens is that as the cells are slowly dying off, um, you're making less and less dopamine. And by the time you get to about 50 to 70% loss of, of those cells and reduction of dopamine, you start to manifest with certain symptoms of this disease um, that I'll talk about next. Um, Parkinson's is actually quite common, but many people do not recognize it because it tends to affect people who are older over the age of 65. And it tends to the symptoms of Parkinson's, it looks like someone is getting older. And so people confuse it, confuse it for just, you know, they're getting older, but they don't realize it's an actual disease that's happening. Um, the only important thing to know is that it affects men um, uh, more than women in about a two to one ratio. Um, this slide is really important. I like to teach people about what the signs of Parkinson's disease is so that people can rec recognize it sooner and come to care sooner. Um, these are some of the most common symptoms, tremor being the most recognizable one, usually on one side, slowness of movements, um, stiffness of the body, poor balance, shuffling gait, so taking very short, tiny steps, a stooped posture, people with Parkinson's tend to lean forward, um, reduced arm swing. This is one of the more recognized symptoms early on. People notice that, usually it's somebody else that notices it, but they stopped swinging one arm compared to the other arm. And then a reduction in facial expression, people with Parkinson's have what we call a masked faces, and um, it's just a, a lack of expression, and they often look down or, or you know, just just low mood. Um, but that's a that's part of the Parkinson. That's very easily treatable. Um, a low voice. Um, and then poor sense of smell, which actually occurs many, many years before the onset of the, of the slowness and the tremor of Parkinson's. Constipation is quite common. Also problems with urination, dizziness, poor sleep, acting out dreams. Again, this happens many, many years before the onset of the, the physical symptoms of Parkinson's. People with Parkinson's, they tend to move a lot and talk in their sleep. Um, depression and anxiety are quite common. And then dementia can also happen in Parkinson's many years after the their initial diagnosis. And I wanna move on to talking about heart disease and um, high blood pressure briefly. Um, I've already mentioned this, but heart disease and high blood pressure, they can lead to blood vessel changes, bad changes that can cause stroke, uh, vision changes, and then dementia and other diseases that affect um, brain health. Um, and it's important to know that nearly half of Americans have high blood pressure. So it's a very, very common thing. Um, it, you know, I, again, I mentioned before that it's a silent killer. Many people have it, but are not aware of that. So it's important to make sure that you're seeing your primary care doctor regularly to check your blood pressure. You can also easily buy a blood pressure um, cough at the pharmacy um, and just check your blood pressure once in a while to make sure that it's good. The, you know, the ideal number, the magic number is 120 over 80. But I think that, you know, anything, you know, between, you know, uh, uh, not above 140 um, over, over 90 is something that's acceptable. So you don't want to be above 140. Once it's above 140, you start, you have to get concerned. Um, and the other important thing to note is that African Americans are at higher risk of having heart disease um, due to high blood pressure. Um, and then some heart problems that I want you guys to be aware of, um, and just to define some terms. So a heart attack um, is uh, one of the other common problems that can affect your brain. Um, a heart attack happens when you have a reduced blood flow to the heart. So one of the blood vessels that actually supplies blood to the heart gets blocked off. Um, some of the symptoms include chest discomfort. You can have discomfort in your left arm some lightheadedness, some nausea, some vomiting. Um, and then it's important to know that in women, heart attacks don't typically present with that chest pain and that left arm pain. Women, it can be quite atypical. And so, you know, studies have been done on this many times that if a woman comes to the emergency room and is having very non-specific complaints, make sure that we always make sure that we get an EKG because it could be a heart attack happening. Um, heart attacks in women are, are are, are quite atypical. They don't often present with that chest pain. So if, you know, if you're a woman in this audience and you're feeling this discomfort, it's something just to be aware of that heart attacks can present atypically. Um, and then arrhythmias, um, I mentioned before, arrhythmias is an abnormal heart rhythm. Um, it can feel like a skipped beat 
or a fluttering um, sensation. Sometimes people can get shortness of breath with it, um, chest pain, lightheadedness. Um, sometimes there are no, no symptoms at all and it's just found incidentally um, um, with an EKG. Um, one of the most common arrhythmias is atrial fibrillation, um, uh, uh, which many people have and you have to be on a blood thinner um, to, to avoid the risk of getting a stroke from the atrial fibrillation. And then heart valve problems are also very common. Your heart valves, they allow flow of blood between the four chambers of your heart. And when one of the valves dysfunction, you can have you know, uh, too much blood flow or, or backup of blood flow. Um, and this can also affect how much blood is getting to your brain and the rest of your body. Now, what are some of the risk factors with heart disease um, and that, that um, you cannot change? So again, age, um, again, being a man and then having a family history. But what are some risk factors that you can change? So again, you, you're starting to see this trend, right? We're having you know, the same list over and over and over again. And these are things that you can change to reduce your risk of heart disease and also to pre preserve your brain health. So again, smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, um, obesity, not being physical active, uh, diabetes, stress, um, drinking ex alcohol excessively, and having an unhealthy diet um, again. And then diabetes is another common um, disease that affects um, not just your brain, but your whole body. Um, diabetes can, um, can cause a lot of damage to blood vessels throughout your brain and also can cause direct damage um, um, in your brain. For those who do not know, diabetes is a condition that causes your blood sugar to rise um, and this causes inflammation. It increases your risk for having a stroke or having a heart attack. Um, and it also can increase your risk for having memory problems and developing um, you know, a, a type of dementia such as Alzheimer's. Um, you know, some people may not know this, but you can actually control your diabetes by you know, physical activity and healthy eating um, and maintaining a healthy weight. And there are many people who have been able to control their diabetes without medication just by doing this. However, everyone is different and your doctor will talk to you about what is the best way to help control your diabetes. But it's just, it just tells you the power of um, exercise and eating a healthy diet. The fact that you know um, those two things can actually control your disease without needing extra medication. So these are things to know. And I wanna talk about falls. Falls are, and, and brain injury, um, falls are very common um, as we all get older. As we all get older in general, your balance starts to become impaired just from getting older, unfortunately. Um, and as you get older, you're at high risk of falling and having other accidents that can affect um, brain injury. And I wanna you know, uh, point this out because um, it's something that I very commonly see in my practice you know, with some of my patients who have Parkinson's and just some people who, have, who are, are older, I always ask about falls um, because you could be doing well one day and then you fall and fracture a hip, end up in the hospital. And then everything just goes downhill from there. Or you can fall and you know sustain a, a bleed in your brain. Um, and, and this is something that is quite preventable. So some things I you know I've, I've put down here some ways to reduce your risk of falling. So exercising, um, exercising really helps to, to strengthen your muscles, to build your core. Um, and um, you know, when your muscles are stronger, you just are you, you're less likely to be blown away by the wind. Okay, that's one way I, I joke about it, but I really like exercise and, and helping people maintain their, their balance. Um, I really like um, Tai Chi, I like yoga. Um, these are some things that are really good for, for balance. Um, you know, I have my patients go to physical therapy to do balance exercises. You know, if, if you have insurance, use up your physical therapy every year, you know, do balance exercises. These are very good. Um, you know, some of my patients and I refer them to a fall prevention class. And these are classes, you know, led by individuals just to help people reduce their risk of fall. Make sure your home is, is, is safe. So, you know, look at rugs and things that you can trip over. Make sure you, you know, you try and separate things so that you're not tripping over things as you're walking by your house. Um, and then also review your medications. Certain medications is increase your risk of falling. Um, also review your vision with your healthcare provider because if you're not able to see well, that can definitely affect your risk of falling. Um, and then this does not need to be said, but you know, make sure you're wearing safety belts and helmets um, and make sure you get enough, enough sleep. Um, I want to talk about depression because I think that this is not talked about enough. As I mentioned to you all, as we all get older, um, you know, your, your brain is making less and less of those chemicals that are responsible for maintaining your mood, um, such as serotonin. Um, and so it's, it's, it's quite common to get depressed as you get older. And in also life circumstances, um, people lose their loved ones and you know, many things can happen in life that can cause you know, significant stress that can lead to depression. Um, but it's important to know that depression is a real illness, okay? Um, and it's due to um, some chemical imbalances in the brain in addition to you know, um, situational 
um, um, incidences that happen in life. Depression can affect your ability to conduct your daily life um, for weeks at a time. Um, and I've had you know, patients who had depression and their depression can, can really affect their memory. And they come to me thinking that they have a dementia, but then, you know, we, we ask them questions, we do some testing, we realize, no, actually we think you're depressed and you treat the depression and then they feel better. Um, so some symptoms, some ways that depression can manifest that it's important to know about. Um, the most common one is feeling sad or feeling hopeless, feeling helpless or, or worthless. Um, and then and other times people may have a lack of interest in doing things that they normally enjoy doing, trouble sleeping, and then feeling grumpy or irritable, that could be a sign of depression, feeling tired all day, even though you've been sleeping well the whole night, having a lack of motivation, and then confusion or attention problems. And then some people, yeah, depression can manifest with eating too much or not eating enough. And then, you know, finally, th thoughts of, you know, ending things, thoughts of death or suicide. These are all different ways that depression can manifest. And if you find that you're having several of these symptoms for more than two weeks, you should definitely speak to your doctor. It's important to know that depression is very treatable. And I wanna talk about sleep apnea. Um, sleep apnea is when you have short pauses in your breathing while you're sleeping or snoring. Um, many people snore and many people ignore it and think that, oh, I just snore and it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. So you can imagine that um, when you're snoring, you're basically gasping for air at night. And so your brain is not getting the oxygen and the nutrients in the blood that it needs. And then imagine that this is happening every single day for many years. Okay, and you're just snoring away and you're getting reduced oxygen flow to your brain. That accumulates injury to your brain over the years. And so when you look at the brain of someone who's been snoring, we see all this tiny damage in their brain because they've been gasping for air at night all these years. And so it's important to know that snoring is actually a serious thing. And I tell my patients, if you're snoring, go get a sleep study and get something done about it because it can lead to brain injury. As I mentioned, it can actually increase your blood pressure it can increase your risk of having a stroke and it can increase um, your memory loss. And so some of the things that I tell my patients that you can do immediately to reduce, um, to reduce the sleep apnea problem is to avoid alcohol because that will increase the snoring. Uh, losing weight helps significantly and then quitting smoking if you're a smoker. And then your doctor may also recommend um, use of special devices such as a CPAP to help your breathing. But if you're someone who snores, or if you know someone who snores, please go get a sleep study. I cannot stress it enough, okay? And then this is a summary. I've already talked about many things, things that you can do to protect your brain health, but just to list them out again, okay? Um, the first thing is to make sure that you're just getting your recommended health screenings, uh, you know, doing your colonoscopy, your mammogram, whatever it is that you need to do, seeing your primary care doctor, you know, once or twice a year, just to make sure that you stay on top of everything. If you have any health conditions, make sure that you're managing them, you know, taking, taking the medications that are recommended, um, exercising, eating a healthy diet, whatever your doctor tells you to do, make sure that you're having appropriate conversations with them and keeping on top of um, all your medical um, conditions. Make sure that your medications that are prescribed for you are right for you. Um, reduce your risk for brain injuries um, due to falls and other types of accidents, and then quitting smoking um, if you're a current smoker. And then I, you know, I cannot stress it enough, but eating a healthy diet, the diet that we tend to recommend that's good for the brain is a Mediterranean diet. Um, it has lots of fruits, vegetables, grains, um, fish, um, you know, natural oils. Um, that's a diet that we found is the best for the heart and for the brain. So that's one that we, we do tend to recommend. Um, eating lean meats, um, fish, poultry, um, low fat or non-fat dairy products, um, reducing the amount of um, uh, solid fats and sugars and, and salt in your food. Um, and then eating proper portion, portion sizes and make sure you're drinking um, enough, enough water. It says fluids here, but I'm going to stress water because um, so, uh, soda is not fluids. Um, make sure you keep your mind active. Um, truly, you know, when th that saying, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it. It's, it's, it's very true. Um, I find out that, you know, some of my patients, actually a lot of my patients, when people retire and they're not doing much, they're not keeping their minds active, um, you start to get more forgetful. So I always encourage, you know, my patients and everyone that I talk to, to make sure that you're finding, you know, mentally stimulating activities to do. Make sure you continue to read books and magazines. You know, I don't encourage sitting in front of the TV all day unless you're playing Jeopardy, um, but find things that stimulate you, play games, try and learn something new 
try and take a new class or try and teach a class, um, try and volunteer or find some other work to do, you know, maybe do something twi twice a week. Um, you know, I tell my patients, you know, if you have grandkids, try and see them as much as possible, safely, of course, you know, with the COVID pandemic, but try and, you know, be around your grandchildren because they will keep you young. So try and keep your mind active as much as possible because the more you um, just, you know, d don't do things with your brain, you just start to get more and more forgetful. Um, and then it's important to stay connected. It has been shown um, that, that loneliness is a risk factor for mortality. Um, I'll say that again, being lonely and being on your own is actually a risk factor for, for, for mortality. So um, I try to you know, help my patients to stay connected in any way possible, joining groups. Um, so like I said you know, before, you know, volunteering, trying to you know, see your family as much as, have, um, as, as possible, um, safely doing social activities outside if possible, um, and joining social programs through you know, your senior centers um, or, and other community organizations um, around you. So it's really important to stay connected. And then what can you do today? I know I've said a lot, um, but I think that you know, each and every one of us can take small steps, you know, pick one thing that you can help, that you can do to help improve your health. And so if it comes to, you know, for example, you know, exercise, you know, you can start by taking a 10 minute walk a few times a week and you can slowly build it. So you can start to slowly build up on that. Um, and then adding more, you know, vegetables to your food. You can start by adding, you know, one small serving of vegetable each day. And then make sure, you know, you make an appointment for a health screen. And if you haven't seen a doctor in a long time, um, many of you that are here probably are, are um, people who see their doctors often, but if you're not someone like that, you know, you can start by just having a health screening and talking to a doctor, establishing care with a doctor. Um, and then, you know, you can start with, by writing down, you know, what you would do and, and when you do it and try and get support from your family, friends and, and community groups. And because if you have people supporting you, you have more motivation to make these changes. Um, these are some websites I have here and, and it'll be available in the, um, in the, on the YouTube presentation just to go for more information, um, community programs and things like that. Um, and then, you know, um, I got some of my information from these organizations and these are also organizations that you can go to to get more um, information. This is the end of my talk and I hope we have enough time to take some questions. I see 18 comments in the chat, so um, we can go from there. Thank you all for, for joining today. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Awesome, thank you so much. We did have a, a few questions already. Uh, okay. I think it was a great talk and it definitely brought up a lot of additional questions. So one of the first ones I noticed, um, someone asked about anxiety and Parkinson's disease and if there's a correlation there. Absolutely. Um, anxiety and also depression are very common in Parkinson's and actually we see it um, quite commonly many years before the onset of the physical symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, so they actually do go, um, do go hand in hand. And then sometimes anxiety can also manifest as one of the symptoms when your medicine in Parkinson's wears off. Um, and so it's, it's very common in Parkinson's. I think something around 70 to 80% of people with Parkinson's experience anxiety um, and there are many treatments for it. Thank you. Um, I also see Rodney's hand is raised. So if you wanna ask a question aloud, that would be great also. Go ahead, Rodney. Most definitely. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you for the presentation. It was very, very good. Um, you, you mentioned about medications and how uh, combinations of medications can sometimes cause the, uh, or, or aspirate the um, problems in the brain. I one was wondering if you have a list of some of these medications, because many of us, I know I myself, I have um, HFib and um, mm -hmm. I was a uh, um, a diabetic, a, uh, you know, but that's no longer the case. I lost 30 pounds and um, I, I do, I do take Tai Chi and stop smoking cigarettes over 14 years ago. So I'm trying to do the best I can, but I have noticed that sometimes I am not as sharp as I wish to be. I was in school once and was answering, a, um, was debating with the professor uh, topic and in the middle of this of the debate I lost my train of thought and and that was very you know, very 
very humiliating, you know, to be standing there and want to debate the issue and they just lose the entire thing. You know, I had to apologize yeah. to class to sit back down. It never really came back. So I'm also a vet, so I went to the veterans hospital and they did a lot of tests and whatnot because I kept complaining about it. Um, and they said this, they, they can't find anything wrong um, with, with my brain, but um, there was no but, that was their conclusion. But to me, you know, I kept and still sometimes, you know, have these lapses, you know, and I do do a lot. Um, I have a very, you know, um, not setting lifestyle. I'm out and about. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm in books all the time. I'm in classes all the time. I do a lot, but it just doesn't seem to help. And, you yeah. know, like I said, when you get those, when I get those memory lapses, they come at the most inopportune times. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I definitely feel your your concern, and this is a very common complaint. And I just want to first of all commend you on just taking such good care of your health and, and losing weight. And it seems like you've been doing all the right things. Um, you know, and if you remember going back to the beginning of my talk, I mentioned that there are some just natural parts of aging that we cannot avoid. Um, you know, as we get older, you're going to have you're going to lose your train of thought sometimes. Um, you may have, you know, lapses in memory sometimes. But the question is, you know, are these issues affecting your functionality? Is it affecting your ability to manage your life? That's where it becomes more of an issue and you worry about, um, and you start to worry about dementia. And based on what you're telling me so far, I'm suspecting that this is a part of normal aging. But I think one of your first questions was, you know, about your medications. And I, I think you're wondering, you know, are your medications also affecting um, your memory. Um, I think it'll be good, you know, to, you know, my patients often send me their list sometimes and ask me, you know, is this okay? Am I taking the right ones? And I tell them, okay, yes. So I think do something like that. Reach out to your doctor and say, you know, these are my list of medicines. Are these okay? Or could these be causing any memory issues? And they can tell you yes or no. Um, and then you also ask me if I have a list. I mean, the list is endless. I'll see if I can find a website that has a list of medications to be aware of can affect, you know, memory and, and see if I can share with Allegra and, and, and she'll share with, with the group. But I know there's information out there, okay? Thank you much. I appreciate it. Of course. I'm going to lower my hand if I can find the button. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, I think I saw Lucretia's hand up next. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. No, that's correct, Lucretia. <laughs> I, this was a great presentation. You know, I really Thank enjoyed you. it. I am 66 with AFib, so a lot of this, you know, natural aging. But I was wondering about the over-the-counter supplements you see on commercials about to improve brain health. I take other supplements, so I was wondering if it's any of that's worthwhile or works. Yeah, yeah, that's um, another very common question that, that we get. Um, here's the short answer. The short answer is that they have many any studies of these um, supplements. Um, that show that um, they do help with uh, memory and, and with brain health. Um, you know, a lot of those supplements are not FDA approved, so you have to take it, you know, with a grain of salt. And that's the, that's the short answer. However, you know, who knows, right? Um, and it also, it's also hard to say, you know, whether they cause any harm because the people who are making these drugs have not actually studied them. Um, you know, what's been proven is, you know, eating a healthy diet, exercising, and taking care of your medical conditions, those have been actually proven. So, you know, I, I'm still waiting for that magic pill that, that has been properly <laughs> studied um, and, and put out there. I'm still waiting for that magic pill until these people, you know, until they study those medications and show us proof and, you know, show that, you know, the group that took the medications, they actually had improved memory then we will start recommending it then. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I also see um, Monica's hand up next, so I'll let you ask away. Yes, hi. This was a great presentation, by the way. Thank um, you. You mentioned snoring, right? And um, I have teenagers and they tend to snore a lot, especially my son. Um, so how, how does that affect, is it the same for children as well as adults? And what can I do uh, to improve his health? Absolutely. Um, so the concept is the same, okay? Any snoring, uh, like I said, you know, snoring, you're just not getting enough air to your brain. Mm -hmm. okay? 
I think, you know, because they're, they're young, you know, the damage has not been done. But if it continues over many years, the damage will be done. Um, so I think that, you know, some of the reversible thing, as I mentioned, was, um, you know, the alcohol, smoking, those affect snoring. But then obesity is the, is the most common thing that causes mm -hmm. snoring. Um, and so if that's a factor in your children's life. That's something that you can target. Um, and if none of those things are a factor, I think, you know, seeing a sleep specialist um, to see if they have any blockage in their, in their nose, um, in, the, um, in the nasal passage, that's another common um, issue um, and that they're not getting enough air. Um, but I'm um, seeing an ENT and seeing, doing a sleep study would be the next step if none of the other things are factors. Right. He was when he was younger, he did have them burn. I think they were an antinoids, antinoids, like polyps. Yeah. Right. So they um, I was told that possibility it might grow back, mm. so thinking that that probably is the issue right now. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I see uh, Larry's hand up as well. If you want to go ahead. I think you're muted though. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I put them in chat, but so what? Uh, number one, uh, you talked about alcohol being a problem. There's this classic thing, classic meaning the last couple of years, a glass of wine at, once a day is really good. American Heart Association says it, but this new research says even that's not a smart move. That's one question. Uh, general thing about, oh, smoking is bad. Please let me know that pot is also bad. And the third thing you're talking about depression, my wife has a severe issue with it. Do you know anything about transcranial magnetic stimulation? Do you have any pr professional contact with it? Because you said, oh, depression is easy to cure or treat. Oh, okay. So your first question was about um, alcohol. alcohol. Yeah, them saying. So I think, you know, everyone, if you're a completely healthy man, or a woman. So for a man, I, I believe it's less than two drinks per day. And for a woman, it's less than one drink per day. That's the current recommendation. Um, and so, but if you're someone who has certain conditions, and I think it's important to talk with the doctor how alcohol would affect those conditions. But if you're someone who is completely pristinely healthy and has no medical issues, and I've met a few of those, I think, you know, your one or two drinks a day is fine. Um, the reason I asked the question is there's new research I mean, like this week kind of new. Oh, okay. I think, out of, I think out of the CDC saying even that one glass a day is generally not smart and they're backtracking. But I, unless you're staying really on top of it, let's wait and see if it's even replicated. You're, you're more different. on top of it than I am, Larry. Um, you have more information than I, than I have. Um, this is how I generally have been recommended to my patients, but I would, yeah, have, sure. to look up, I would have to look up that new information um, and, and see what the studies show. My idea of a really wild time is a, a one shot glass of, of scotch, turn down the lights, listen to classic FM radio out of London, read a book for half an hour. But I have to have either halibut or chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> part of the deal. Not the point. Next is smoking. I assume you didn't mention it. Smoking is bad. I assume that pot is in the same bucket. Uh, when you say pot, you mean medical um, ma marijuana? Street drugs. Marijuana. Yeah. So um, marijuana is being uh, legalized in different places. Um, in the medical community, um, it really depends. So marijuana is now being used um, for uh, several uh, different diseases. Uh, and marijuana contains CBD, THC, um, you know, one is more active. Um, in epilepsy, there are medications that actually use the active ingredients to treat um, different epilepsies. Um, in Parkinson's disease, um, we don't discourage it. We have found that um, it's helpful for um, anxiety. Um, it helps with sleep. Um, and it also helps with, um, uh, uh, with your mood. Um, and it also helps with improve your appetite. It stimulates appetite and, and helps our patients gain weight. Um, so I don't discourage my patients to, to use um, medical marijuana. And I actually have a lot of patients um, using it. And so I think that um, the way that we look at marijuana has changed. Um, and different medical communities are trying to are investigating what are the, um, the potential um, benefits that marijuana can have so for certain diseases. Um, and so far, at least in my world of Parkinson's disease, we don't, dis we don't discourage it. It's not the chemical constituents. I'm asking about the smoking of the pot as opposed to brownies oh, and candies. Gummy bears. Yeah, I if they know smoking, I would assume pot is just as bad when you smoke it. I see, and how it affects compared to cigarettes. That, it's the particulates that, that I'm looking at, and the the hot the hot gases and things, I not see. the chemical constituents. 
I see. So that is less well studied and we're not sure. Um, but in general, you know, certain studies have shown that long term chronic use of marijuana um, can affect memory. That is something that has been shown. Um, and and we, they have seen that, you know, even some young people who chronically use marijuana, their memory um, is already affected um, at a young age. Got yeah. it. Last, last one. He said something about oh, depression is eminently treatable. I always thought that depression was particularly hard to treat, but there is something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. Uh, it's fairly new. Uh, I know that um, several hospitals in the town are doing it. Yeah. It's not fringe, but it's fairly new. Get in yeah. contact with it and what it might do either for, for um, depression or the kind of the other issues you're talking about today. Yeah, of course. So I have seen patients who have had transcranial um, magnetic stimulation. It's not something that um, I do in my practice because um, I focus on Parkinson's disease and, and movement disorders. But, um, you know, the people that I've seen that have had it, um, they have found this successful. And so it's another way to avoid, um, you know, medications. If you're someone who's very sensitive or who has just not found medication for depression, that's worked. So, I mean, it is treatment that is being used and so many people have found it beneficial. And my impression is it's fairly benign. That's the impression, but we need more studies to know long-term what will happen. We need more studies is like the theme song of this decade. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your patience with me, I'm grateful. Of course, thanks, Larry. Thank you so much. I think we're running out of time, but um, if it's all right with you, there's just two more questions, I think, that we can- Of course, I'm okay staying until uh, 2.15. Okay, awesome, thank you so much. Um, there's just one I saw in the chat. Um, it says, since the literature indicates that elderly people are not necessarily included in most clinical trials and studies, what are your recommendations about working with physicians to ensure that you are the beneficiary of optimum healthcare? I don't know who asked that question and do you mind, I don't know, rephrasing? Yeah, that is from Muhammad. Mohammed, do you mind asking the question? So, no, I, I don't mind. No, okay. what the reason, uh, uh, you, you did a great presentation, but the reason Thank why you. I ask it is that uh, a lot of studies saying that in terms of efficacy of medicine, mm -hmm. a lot of older people are not included in a lot of clinical studies and trials. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the doctors sometimes who tend to work with older people are not necessarily adept in terms of the implication of efficacies in terms of medical treatment. So since you talk about excellently about this topic, how can we ensure that when we go to a physician that we can get optimum care so that we can get the best uh, treatment, best intervention around maintaining optimum health? I see. Um, you know, I think when it comes to clinical trials, there are, there are many limitations. Um, and a lot of times, you know, um, people who are older adults or elderly may be limited from clinical trials because of certain comorbidities that they have. Um, it's not an excuse, but it is, um, it is the case. Um, and I think, unfortunately, doctors have to use the data that we have and extrapolate it to other populations that weren't even studied for that medication or for that um, for that intervention. Um, I think that you know it's a case by case basis, and when you go to your doctor, you know you ask them, you know, was this studied in someone my age and how safe it is, and they can give you anecdotal evidence and say something like, you know, yes, I've used this medicine in many people your age in my practice, and it, no one has had any of these side effects or blah blah blah. But I think it starts with you know you asking the question. Um, I think that you know if you're an older adult, um, maybe you know, putting your care more towards um, um, a geriatrician, um, you know, a, a primary care doctor who sees people um, um, in the geriatric population or older adults because they are more sensitive to the issues that affect the um, older adults community and the geriatric community. So, you know, that's something extra to think about. Um, that, that's something else I, I would suggest, but um, I hope that answers that question. No, it, it does, it, it, but you don't have enough time for us to um, mediate the other things you raised, which are the question of the disparities that impact certain groups. Or uh, whether those disparities also talk about the unavailability of geriatric specialists to deal with those population, diabetes, heart, the, you know, the, the numbers you put. It's an excellent, but it's a place to begin. And I want to thank you for what you did. It's, it's excellent. Thanks. So thank, thank you very much, Mohammed. Thank you. May, may I ask a question? I don't know how to type it in. Sure. Are there vision changes with taking Cinemat and or Parkinson's? I'm having vision problems. 
Um, yes, vision changes um, can happen with Parkinson's. Um, however, vision changes also do happen um, as you get older. And it's often hard to determine which is which. And Parkinson's is quite nonspecific. Um, some people can get some blurry vision. Um, you can also double, get- Double vision. Double, yeah, you can get double, um, double vision also um, because the extraocular muscles around the eyes are responsible for moving the eyes. They get weaker as we all get older, but they can also be affected in Parkinson's um, a disease. So you can, you can have eye movements that are not really um, uh, correlating with each other. Um, and so double vision can also happen. Um, I often send my patients who are having um, significant vision problems to a, a neuro-ophthalmologist who specializes in Parkinson's and it can help correct some of those problems. Thank you. Of course. I have a question. May I ask a question, please? Sure. Uh, okay. Um, I discovered I have a I have um swelling under my eye, especially my right eye, and I spoke to my ophthalmologist about it, but he told me something about some something like fat drainage or something. But I noticed because, because I have enough sleep, I, I'm not lack of sleep at all, and then that's what's bothering me. Why am I having this swelling? under my right eye. Swelling under the right eye. Um, yeah, especially the right eye. Yeah, it doesn't sound like a sleep problem because then it would affect both eyes. So if it's just one eye, maybe there's something that's not draining well or an infection. Um, I would see an eye doctor for that. I'm not an eye specialist. But, but I, I spoke with my ophthalmologist about it and he told me about some something draining, some fat draining somewhere. Okay. Uh, but I, I, I'm yet to get any uh, right answer about it. See another ophthalmologist. <laughs> that's a very, that's a serious recommendation. You know, it's your health, it's your body. Your I spoke with ophthalmologist. I do have an ophthalmologist. Who I no, I said, see a, another one. Um, you're always- Get a second opinion. Get a second uh, opinion. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, okay, that's what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. You're always entitled to a second opinion. It's your health and your body. And if you're not getting the answers you need, find another doctor that will give you the answers. But it sounds like an, an eye problem, which I don't know. I don't know too much about the eyes. Thank you. I'm trying to you're ask welcome. a question. I, I don't know how. Sure. Can I, can you, you can hear me? Yes, yes. Hi, Ellen. Okay, hi. My question is, my husband snores 365 days a year and sometimes very loud. Um, but I don't, we, I don't, I don't know if he has sleep apnea. Are the issues that you're talking about, Ron, the buzzer, please. Are the issues you're talking about only for sleep apnea or are they for all snoring? Um, for Cause he all may not have sleep apnea. He tried to get it tested. The machine didn't work. We tried twice. It never worked. They don't know if it's defective or he's not doing it right. So the issue is, what I said. Does it apply to all snoring? Really? Yeah. For all snoring, yes. Wow. Because when okay. you just think about the mechanics of it, you're just not getting enough oxygen anytime you're snoring. And well, so he's got polyps. He's got polyps in his nose. Could that be it? Yes. Okay. I understand. I'm very glad that I listened to this and learned. Yeah, that. nice to see you, Ellen. Thank you. Um can I ask, can I make a statement if you don't yeah, mind? Sure. Yeah, who's, who's speaking? Yeah, Rodney. Okay, yes, yes, go ahead. I see you now. Okay. Um, the, earlier, Larry talked, um, asked about pot smoking. And this some re it's the only reason why I'm addressing this issue, because a lot of people don't like to admit what they do. So I'm going to make a blanket statement since that is my ballywhack. Medical marijuana and street marijuana are not exactly the same thing. When you go to most street dealers, you do not see what's going on in the background. And what a lot of street dealers do is they treat their pot with chemicals to try to increase its, its strength. And, you know, um, and a lot of times they don't know exactly what they're putting in it. They only heard that this will, this will make my pot better and will still better on the street. Remember, they are trying to sell something. They have no idea what they're doing half the time. And you don't really want that. So if you think you have a condition where you can get medical marijuana, talk to your doctor, get medical marijuana. It's safer. It's controlled. It's, you know, it's, it's managed. 
not only by the dispensary that's giving it, but by the government also in the FDA. So not the FDA, the DEA. So you need to turn around and, and do that instead of buying street marijuana. If you can stay away from street marijuana, stay away from street marijuana. I wholeheartedly agree. Thank you so much, Rodney. That's a great comment. Yes. Thank you. I see, I think Beverly's hand is up and I think this might have to be our last question just because we don't want to keep Dr. Nrababi too late. Thanks, Alaya. Yeah. And hi, thank you so much, Dr. Linda. It's a great presentation. Thank you. My question has to do with sleep apnea. Okay. There are stories that say that a sleeping position should be um, regulated. Don't know if you should be sleeping on your back, on your right side, left side. Do you have any information that you can share? So that's a very good question. Um, it, it really depends on the, the person's body habitus. Um, I don't know much about body positions, but I think, um, just think about it this way. Anything that closes up your neck and um, covers up your windpipe, essentially, any position that does that will affect the amount of air that you're getting in. So if you're sleeping on your back and your neck is kind of bent forward like this, you're not going to get a nice um, um, airflow. Um, let me see, let me think of, of other positions. Um, it really depends on how your neck is postured. So a lot of times, you know, the, you know we tell people to have um, like a nice uh, neck pillow that's able to keep your um, neck extended um, and to keep your, your passageway open. That's, that's the main thing that we recommend. So any position, so whether you're sleeping on your side, as long as your neck is extended and not, you know, flexed, um, that will be the best position to get an, enough air in. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. And okay. I and I, I also heard about maybe elevating um, the head of the bed. Yes, but I but I have heard that it is recommended that people should sleep on their stomachs, which sometimes may precipitate some GERD that can cause some other problems. So, you know, <laughs> I'm in a quandary about exactly what it is that needs to be done. I see. Well, it really depends on your situation or, you know, the person's situation and figure out what mm -hmm. your problems are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th this is why I tell, you know, people, you know, talk to your primary care doctor who knows you well and knows all your medical problems well. And then you can decide, OK, what is the best position for me to take based on the problems that you have? But in general, for sleep apnea is any position that helps hyperextend, um, hyperextend your neck. Um, and then sleeping 30 degrees also helps, but um, also helps with the GERD because it, it prevents the reflux from coming back up if you're sleeping too flat. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. I think that is it for questions today. Um, it's all we have time for, but if anyone wants to reach out to my email, I'll link it below if you have anything, any other comments or questions. Um, and thank you again for the amazing presentation and for all your insightful questions. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. You guys have been awesome and I've also learned um, a lot from you guys and I hope to come back and, and give another talk in the near future. Definitely, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Have a good day, everyone, okay? You too. Bye, everyone.